Warning, this program will discuss adult themes. Viewer discretion is advised. Hi, my name is Mary, I'm from Minnesota, and this is my 11th consecutive Courage Conference, and I was asked by Angelo to come and introduce Father Jim. Father Jim has been a family friend for 20, 22 years. It's been a long time. He was one of the reasons why I joined the church I now belong to, and, uh, and then he was reassigned, so it's... it's <laughs> but that, that's the way it goes. Um, I just want to share some of my family experience. Uh, in 93, my husband walked out of the family. I, two weeks later, I found out about a group of women who was meeting. They called themselves the Covenant Marriage Apostolate. Father Jim was their spiritual director, and he helped us formulate some thoughts and uh, a direction for our group, and we still meet. And fidelity to our marriage vows and living chaste lives. And uh, my family also went with him to World Youth Day in Denver. We were part of a bus group. My son was in minor seminary at the time, and then he left that group and came back with us. My youngest daughter, I have three girls and a boy, and the, the, my son is 38, and he's the reason why I'm here. But um, Amanda, the youngest one, um, she would, I, for one year, I put her into a school where Father Jim was living at the time while he was working in another church in St. Paul. Unbeknownst to you, Father, she would be not paying attention to class, looking out the window for you and trying to get your attention by throwing pencils out the window. She never succeeded. He became her confirmation sponsor. And she, he was the first one that she spoke to when she found out about her brother. He was also the first priest that I talked to, and he referred me to another Courage member before our group in uh, Minneapolis-St. Paul started. Um, I want to say that he was ordained on June 2nd, 1990, and that's the day before St. Charles Luanga's feast day, which is very symbolic to us. He's been at my house several times. One time he came with... Uh, while they were associates, Father Duffner and Father Jim and our pastor, and while Father Duffner and Father Jim were in my um, hallway, my husband's Lutheran aunt came in, and I introduced her. I said, here is Father Duffner and Father Livingston, and she said, hello, Pastor Duffner and Pastor Livingston. She, she was shaking hands, and she says, I'm a Lutheran, but we're all the same. And Father Duffner just set up, stood up and said, no, we're not. Now, Father Livingston, I was just shocked at that point, and I thought, you know, speak the truth in love. So you'll, <laughs> you'll have to help me remember the rest of the story. Um, Father Jim has prayed over me. He's prayed over us over years. I remember one Pentecost, I uh, went to St. Raphael's, and when I went, you know, and you realized it was me, he just laid his hand so heavily on my head and interceded, and it just felt wonderful. I just felt the love of God come through this man. He has given retreats and has been here. He's been our chaplain for Encourage Group many times. And um, I just want to look over my notes so I don't miss anything important. I, another thing I don't know if you remember, but one day it was your birthday early on, and while we were at evening mass, which you were celebrating, Jeff and Joe were out teeping your car. They did a really good job of making his antenna look like a monstrance. So afterwards, we <laughs> got some birthday cake. So there's been a family connection for years, and it's, he's a loving man. He's a man who gives us hope. And I remember um, a few stories that he said um, about a young man who had long hair and rode a motorcycle and apparently decided he wasn't going to practice his Catholic faith anymore. Somewhere along the line, the hand of God came in, the goodness of God, hope, I guess, and he decided to seek out his parish priest and said, um, Father, I want to become a priest, and his pastor said, Jim, I think you should try living as a Catholic first. <laughs> Maybe we'll hear more about this story, but it was, it was, that shows me hope, so while my, fun, my son has walked away from, from his faith for a while, I still cling to hope, and I want to thank you, Father Jim, for being an important part of our life, so please welcome him. Thank you, Mary. I'm, I'm wondering where that young man with the long hair went. I, actually, I'm wondering where the hair went is what I'm, what I'm wondering.
wondering. Uh, I'd like to thank Father Check for. Yes, sir. Okay. I'd like to th thank Father Check for inviting me to uh, to give a. Uh, uh, a, a talk for this year's conference. He invited me last year. Uh, towards the end of the conference, I said, "Sure, I'll do that." And I sort of ruminated a little bit what what that would be on. Uh, I had a hunch that I knew what I was that I wanted to talk about. Had to do with with a sense of hope and um, and God's goodness. Um, I had uh, tried for a while to uh, to pray in a, a kind of a more silent and contemplative way than I was used to at the urging of a, a friend of mine who has a very deep, deep spiritual life. And I think I was trying to be a copycat. And uh, what, it, what happened is that I wound up experiencing internally um, a, a kind of a feeling of abandonment, spiritual abandonment. And that set, that set me off on a kind of a, of a journey of where is that coming from and what's, what's that all about? And, um, and so I was, uh, I wanted really much, I wound up thinking a lot about the goodness of God. And uh, then Father Check came to the Twin Cities, uh, you know, some time ago, and he said, you know, I think we really need to talk about the goodness of God. And I said, you know what, I'm already, I'm already on that. I'm, I'm, I'm good to go. So, so the, the topic of the, of, that I'd like to talk on is the goodness of God. And, and the title I gave was the, uh, Reclaiming the Gift of Hope. It is a gift. Um, I think it's also, I'm describing it in terms of the virtue of hope as well. I'd like to thank my, uh, uh, the guys in the, in the Courage Group back home. I got a chance to, uh, to give a draft of this talk to them last Friday. And uh, they said, you know, it's really great. You know, I basically read it to them, which I'm pretty much going to, sorry, do for you again today. Uh, but they said, uh, just let them know that you're going to do that. Have them close their eyes and just think of it as a meditation. And, and so I, I could, you know, invite you to do that with the caveat that um, most of the time I don't give meditations. I give medications. <laughs> and and I, I, you know, I... On a pilgrimage, you know, when I pray the rosary, I give a little thought about it. I look back, and they've all got their eyes closed and their tongues hanging out and then snoring. But so that happens up there in the back row. I'll, I'll know. So with that, I'd like to. I would like to share um, these thoughts and these reflections, and in a certain way, these instructions on the goodness of God and the virtue of hope. And this is how I'd like to begin. A, a little image, if you, if you will, and you might even just close your eyes for this if you like. And consider that memory is mother to many children. From her are born grudges and gratitude, obedience and loyalty, homesick hearts, and the simple prayer of recollection. Promises made and promises kept are her children too. But the child of memory which has found favor over all the rest is hope. Because hope was chosen by God to escort the souls of men home to God. Charity, a daughter of the will, God chose as queen. Her royal blood transforms the slave into a child of the king of heaven and a rightful heir. All that the soul gives and receives in her name must be remembered and honored in heaven. Faith, a child of the intellect, is the soul's acolyte, her bearer of light that she may walk a sure and certain path. But it is hope that defends the soul on her journey, encourages her when the path seems long and narrow and hard to bear, and enlists help from heaven to strengthen, comfort, and build her up, to do battle against her enemies in time of need. It is hope whose confident song 
along the way both quiets the soul and at the same time alerts heaven's watchtowers that the soul is in need. At journey's end, hope will knock at heaven's gates, seeking entrance for her charge. And then at long last, their service ended, hope and faith will bid the soul farewell. The truth will at last be seen, and the good will at last be owned. And with charity alone, the soul will enter the halls of heaven to possess and to be possessed by all that is good and strong and wise. Hope in the natural order is a passion for a good thing difficult to attain. Hope is the strength to endure the difficulty motivated by the strength of desire. When desire is strong, hope is strong. Because the desired good is difficult to possess, hope must ally herself with courage and must resist fear, despair, and presumption. The object of Christian hope is God. We hope for the manifestation of God and his kingdom. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the old heaven and the earth, the old earth have passed away. Behold, the dwelling of God is with men. He will dwell with them and they shall be his people. We hope for our resurrection at his return. Our commonwealth is in heaven and from it we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will change our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body. We hope for happiness with God in heaven while we await that day. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And we hope for union with God here on earth through charity and grace. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. In a word, the Christian soul desires the goodness of God made known by his word. St. Thomas Aquinas observed that what is real is what is good. Theologians may strive to understand God, but it is the reality of God more than the idea of God that the Christian soul desires to enjoy him substantially and personally, to be known by God chosen, wanted, and loved by God, to be in his presence, to be his friend, his child, his spouse, to experience with him mutual delight. The motive of Christian hope is then the goodness of God insofar as he has declared his intention to act and to help Hope says yes to God's word of promise and anticipates fidelity from God, not betrayal. The fruit of hope, the proof of it, is that the soul keeps moving forward with goodwill and steadfast effort, cooperating with God's grace, bearing the burden of not yet having with confidence, humility, and peace. Desire, confidence, and cooperation. For a moment, let's look at each part one at a time. Desire. Charity and hope have this in common. They both desire to be with God, to find rest in him, to delight in his presence. Charity seeks God for the joy of giving her love to him. Hope seeks God for the joy of receiving God's love from him. Charity sings, You alone I long to worship. You alone are worthy of my praise. Hope sings, The king of love my shepherd is. His mercy fails me never. I nothing lack if I am his. And he is mine forever. 
But both seek God as the greatest good. Both are virtues. Both are needed. Both are holy. In this life, in the real world, one cannot exist without the other. Virtues are well-ordered habits of the soul. Hope is a well-ordered and wise desire when it remembers by faith that God alone can satisfy the human heart, which is made for perfect and permanent joy. Our hearts are restless until they rest in God, said St. Augustine. St. John of the Cross's famous counsel, nada, 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 speaks to the same truth. No possession, no joy, no knowledge or consolation or rest, except in God will suffice. In God alone, O my soul, let your heart find rest. The biblical version of this teaching is oft repeated. The pearl of great price once found is purchased by selling all that the merchant had. It is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. As a king will not do battle unless he has the troops to succeed. So unless you renounce all your possessions, you cannot be my disciples. Desire for God is made strong and steadfast as desires for lesser things are forgotten. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. But hope is not all discipline and pruning. The Christian spirit is generous. If goodness you seek, then goodness you must give. The gate you open is the path you will walk. The door you knock on is the room you will enter. The judgment you render is the judgment you receive. And the measure you give will be the measure you get back, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. The expectation of his help Therese of the child Jesus said, holiness does not consist in this or that practice. It consists in a disposition of heart which makes us humble and little in the arms of God, well aware of our feebleness, but boldly confident in our Father's goodness. The very thing stolen from the human heart in the beginning was confidence in God. By gossip and by grumbling, Satan conned our first parents into distrusting God. And from then on, we have had, spiritually speaking, a kind of genetic disposition or inclination toward distrust and forgetfulness of his presence and help. The philosophers and theologians tell us that God is good, And the nature of goodness is to be diffusive of itself as light spreads from its source or as life instinctively seeks to be fruitful and multiply. What nature does by instinct, God does personally and deliberately. He wills the good. God, our Savior, desires all men to be saved. God is love. And the nature of love is to desire to be among the beloved and to wish the beloved well. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. The expectation of his help is a matter of faith. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. St. Paul made this assurance the cornerstone of his theology. Do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that you may do the will of God and receive what is promised. Hope remembers the promise. Hope keeps the soul anchored in God's word so that it won't be swept away by passing thoughts and plans, fears and desires, or competing promises and memories. 
Save us, O Lord, we are perishing, they cried out in the storm. Why are you afraid, O men of little faith, he said to them. Then he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was great calm. As if to look in our eyes and shake our hand, his final word to us was, I am with you always to the close of the age. Hope honors God by remembering his word with confidence. The effort to achieve. If the desire for God's goodness towards us and confidence in his good nature are the principal motives for hope, the effort to achieve is where the rubber meets the road. Pray as if it all depends on God, says St. Augustine, and work as if it all depends on you. Work and prayer, ora et labora, is the motto for all who follow St. Benedict. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, says Jesus, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Faith by itself, says his brother James, if it has no works, is dead. Apparently, once saved, always saved Christians need not apply. Now, let's look at hope from its opposites, presumption and despair. Presumption and despair are children of pride. Pride is an inordinate love of one's own excellence, an exaggeration of one's own merits. Pride esteems only the greatness in one's self, blinding the soul to the goodness of the other, sapping its strength to bear the burden of hope. Two kinds of presumption fail hope. The first, that kind that would have what God has not promised, his forgiveness without repentance, his glory without merit, his friendship without fidelity. This kind of presumptuous soul is gaming the system, like the proverbial hare racing the tortoise, or the five foolish virgins waiting to get in with no oil in their lamps. The first sin of the first man sought the knowledge of good and evil that he might be his own guide and not have to obey. True hope understands that the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. David would not offer unto the Lord a burnt offering that cost him nothing. And hope understands that God's promises demand our responsibility and humility. You are my friends if you do what I command you. The other kind of presumption is the excessive reliance on our own strength forgetting that our effort must be a collaboration with God's grace and help. Peter is the poster boy with his famous line, I will not deny you. <laughs> the object of our hope is a person, not a thing. Pope Benedict calls prayer an encounter of two freedoms. Hope is doomed if we think it to be a one-way effort. St. Paul learned to reject the law as the path to salvation because in the end, it relies on itself to win God. Neither kind of presumption seemed to remember that every good thing is a real thing. And every real thing requires that we conform to it in order to possess it. As truth is the conformity of the mind to reality, so our hearts, minds, and conduct must conform to the reality of God and his ways. Presumption is the inordinate hope of doing what is above one's power because we cannot make reality conform to us, no matter how tempted we are to live in fantasy. Presumption ultimately does not take into account the true nature of the other. It is not yet in an I-thou mode. It is I and I alone. When a difficult good is perceived to be inaccessible, 
When hope is tested, the soul too rooted in aloneness and self will turn to despair. A soul too rooted in self will seek virtue more for her own satisfaction than for God's. Her sins distress her more because of her own pride than because they offend God. Despair retreats into aloneness and abandons faith in God's goodness and his promise to help. Judas Iscariot is the sad face of despair. Without confidence, any number of weeds will invade the garden of the soul. Despair might be the final fruit, but discouragement, sadness, and anxiety are in the hidden root. The pusillanimous soul seeks, lacks courage and determination. Discouragement leads to an evil sadness, sloth, a repugnance at effort because the work is judged too difficult. Recall the servant who hid his talent in the ground instead of investing the master's money. What little he had was taken away. Sadness in turn begets anxiety, an inordinate desire to be freed from a present evil or to acquire a hoped for good. With the single exception of sin, says St. Francis de Sales, anxiety is the greatest evil that can happen to a soul. Just as sedition and internal disorders bring total ruin on a state and leave it helpless to resist a foreign invader, so also if our heart is inwardly troubled and disturbed, it loses the strength necessary to maintain the virtues it had acquired and the means to resist the temptations of the enemy. His advice is a masterpiece of prudence. Put your mind at rest and in peace and have a calm judgment and will. Try gently and meekly to accomplish your desire, taking in regular order the most convenient means, not carelessly, but without hurry, trouble, or anxiety. In other words, do the best you can and take the best step forward. The gentleman saint continues, the sovereign remedy against all temptation, whether great or small, is to open your heart and express its suggestions, feelings, and affections to your director. Note well that the first condition the evil one makes with the soul he desires to seduce is for it to keep silence. Just as those who want to seduce girls or women from the very first forbid them to say anything about their proposals to father or husband. Again, we see that the heart of despair is isolation from God and others, and that the heart of hope is solidarity with God and others. Recall now goal number three of the courage meeting to foster a spirit of fellowship in which we may share with one another our thoughts and experiences so that none of us will have to face the pressures and problems of homosexuality alone. Now, I would like to consider certain obstacles to the virtue of hope, which have their source in life experience, and then propose some, hopefully, positive responses. Life experience does influence hope because expectations are fueled by memory. What has been is what we expect again. That's why hope is said to be rooted in the memory. Happiness with God may well be beyond what I has seen or ear heard, but in real life, our relationship with God is often a projection of our relationships with paternal, caregiving, or authority figures in our childhood. Childhood is a kind of developmental sacrament of, e of eternity. Children are chronologically challenged. As opposed to adults, the experiences and lessons of childhood 
take deep root in this in their hearts and souls. A child invests his trust and faith in his emotional perceptions and realities of life. To the child, there is nothing more. What happens then is what will happen forever. Safety and satisfaction in relationships with parents, attachments, take place then or not at all. Often as not, adults will spend a lifetime expecting, seeking, and recreating what is familiar from childhood. In the absence of positive childhood memories, confidence in God's promises can be challenging. The expectation of failure, abandonment, or rejection are wounds of the heart which are particularly damaging to hope. But if every child is vulnerable to the sins of his family system, he also inherits his portion of the original sin of humanity, pride, envy, anger, lust, greed, sloth, gluttony, in different amounts, are allotted to each child born of woman. Those whose dominant fault is pride are particularly vulnerable to losing sight of the presence and promise of the good God. For the reasons already noted, pride is an excessive esteem of the self and an insufficient esteem of the other. I find it fascinating that in his letter to the Romans, St. Paul attributes the gay lifestyle to a pride that refuses to acknowledge the goodness of God. Although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their senseless minds were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images. That which is good is that which is real. To be is to be good. Hope seeks the reality, the experience of God. Pride seeks a projection, an image, a fantasy, because it will not abide in the truth or goodness of the other. If, childhood's, if, if childhood is nature's sacrament of eternity, then grace working on nature must surely supply one too. Unless you turn and become like children, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. The supernatural parallel to childhood with its deeply rooted and life-guiding experiences is the power of the Holy Spirit to give a second birth that the soul might be born again. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. We each have our own personal history written in our flesh and blood. But in the new life given us by the Holy Spirit, we enter salvation history and begin to share the story of Christ. As childhood is the cornerstone of our natural life, so Christ is the cornerstone of our new life in the Spirit. Now it is Christ who shapes our memory and defines our horizons. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. Recall, that the love of God has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. The Holy Spirit is precisely the love mutually experienced between God the Father and God the Son. We have been given the promise of living in the crossfire of love between the Father and the Son, of living in the mutual delight of the Father and Son. Jesus experiences the Father as strong, good, and wise. The Father is someone worthy of the Son's obedience and admiration. The Father experiences the Son as someone in whom he takes delight. You are my beloved Son. With you I am well pleased. The Son experienced human parents who manifested virtuous love toward themselves 
and who guarded his human journey of maturity. Jesus was able to grow in grace and wisdom before God and man. As an adult, his vocation was to take upon himself the burden of the world. As a child, he was not forced to take on his parents' burdens. They protected his sense of hope and wonder. Abide in my love, says the Lord to his friends. Abide in my love. Live in my house. Learn from the expectations and experiences of my heart and my home. Cease being a wild child. Learn to be at peace. Learn to be secure that the Father in whose house you dwell is present, is good, wise, and strong. Learn to be secure that in Jesus you have an elder brother who is your companion and mentor in your spiritual childhood. Learn to be secure that in Mary you have a mother who is not obtuse, intrusive, or weak. How can the Holy Spirit help us to be strong in hope? How can a man be born again once he is old? All things are possible to him who believes. The Spirit of God ministers to us as he did to Christ. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his Spirit who dwells in you. Not only in the resurrection to come, but even now, in every need, the Spirit of God intercedes. The Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with sighs too deep for words. The Word of God and the living prayer of the church are the privileged domains of the Holy Spirit. Through them, the Holy Spirit prudently admits us into the interior life of Christ. In the Psalms, we take on the mind of Christ and meet his faithful disciples. Listen to a verse from Psalm 145. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever. Great is the Lord and word greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. Psalm 145 is the song of Christ as our elder brother, who models for us a relationship of trust and satisfaction between father and son. He sees the Father as good, wise, and strong. He speaks of him with admiration, without embarrassment. If it is not in us to praise God with our hearts, we can still be present as Christ, our elder brother, praises him. Listen to Psalm 63, Sunday morning's prayer of the church. O God, you are my God, I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where no water is. And it goes on. Psalm 63 is the love song of the Christian's mother, the church, and or Mary, as she waits with confidence through the dry darkness of the perceived absence of her spouse, the divine guest. When we hear this psalm prayed, We are children hearing our mother sing this love song of fidelity and trust. She does not confide with us her distaste or discouragement with her spouse. She does not make of us her surrogate spouse. She does not groom us to become her well of emotional support. The New Testament in particular was written when the memory of God's face and voice were still vivid. It was also written in a time of great testing when the prince of this world tried mightily to drive out the power of that memory. 
For a little while you may have to suffer various trials so that the genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, which though perishable is tested by fire, may redound to praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Without having seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with unutterable and exalted joy. As the outcome of your faith, you obtain the salvation of your souls. The stories of the persistent widow, the Syrophoenician woman, our Lord's teaching on perseverance and prayer are all lessons in hope. To read the New Testament with respect is to place ourselves under the intercessory love of those who lived in those times. Besides the purely scriptural tradition, we have at hand the great religious traditions. I mentioned the wisdom of St. Francis de Sales. I'd also like to mention the Ignatian tradition of the daily examine and the rules for discernment. The daily examine is an acknowledgement that God is first of all with me, blessing me, actively helping me. Gratitude allows me to see his hand at work. A woman on pilgrimage stated upon arrival overseas when we were all dog tired that she would be making her entry into her gratitude journal before she allowed her eyes to sleep. Upon inquiry, she explained that it is a list of five things she is grateful for for the day, a simple and effective reminder that God's hand is always open to give. We are not alone, nor must we anticipate abandonment. With gratitude and the help of discernment, I begin to experience God's good spirit in my emotional life, offering me peace, joy, security, and confidence, bringing me closer to God and to others. I begin to experience God as a person who does, in fact, touch my life affectively. He is one in whom it is possible to experience delight. He coaches me in times of consolation and in times of desolation. He is for me what his spirit is known for, encouragement, comfort, and edification. I would also like to mention the Carmelite tradition of recollection, the practice of the presence of God. Through imagination, intention, and blessed reminders, I recall and remember that God is with me. Blessed reminders would be any external reminder of God's presence. The crucifix on the wall, the Bible on the table, the Eucharist reserved in the chapel, even nature itself, insofar as it is God's handiwork. Jesus spoke of the sun in the rain, in the rain, in terms of belonging to his Father and being acted upon by the Father. The earth is his footstool, and the heavens are his throne. Anyone who experiences delight and satisfaction in a drive in the country, a camping, fishing, or a hiking trip, are in fact remembering the good God. The imaginative recollection is more or less any interior reminder of God's presence and help. I work at a hospital located as the crow flies between two Catholic parishes, St. Margaret Mary to the southeast and Sacred Heart to the northwest. One day as I walked the halls, it occurred to me that I was in the crossfire of love between St. Margaret Mary and the Sacred Heart. <laughs> it made my day. The book of Revelation speaks of the presiding spirits of various local churches. And we are certainly encouraged to recall our own good angels similarly watching over us personally. Psalm 139 verse 2 reminds us that God knows when we sit and when we stand. The most common of movements might be reminders that God's eyes never leave us. There are no latchkey kids in the kingdom of God. The Purpose Driven Life may have been a popular book title, but it is also a good description of a day intentionally lived for God. 
Jesus said, I have come to do my Father's will. Our practice of making our morning offering and choosing or accepting all things for his sake make our days living altars. Every day is a sacrifice, just a different altar. Faith gives meaning and purpose to the smallest act of kindness and even to the greatest contradictions. We rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Finding the providential hand of God in all things is to remember his presence and therefore to grow in hope. And finally, I would like to mention advice given by St. Paul. Address one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with all your heart. Music has a way of cheering the heart. St. Francis de Sales said the evil one has often ceased to work because of it. At the dedication of Solomon's temple, the glory of the Lord filled the house of God when the song was raised in praise to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. And Jesus himself sang a hymn with his disciples on Holy Thursday before they went out to the Mount of Olives. Music therapists find that dementia patients will remember how to sing even after they've forgotten how to talk. No wonder that music finds a place in the memory and encourages the virtue of hope. Once again, faith and reason prove themselves children of the same God. In conclusion, hope is a supernatural virtue which mainly operates from the memory, but which employs many virtues of the intellect and will. Hope is our supernatural appetite for God's goodness and a well-formed hope means a right relationship with the good God. God is all good and worthy of our desire and confidence. As Christians, our wellspring of hope is Christ himself, communicated to us through the gift of the Holy Spirit. Scripture and tradition are the chosen instruments by which we are formed in Christian hope, building on our experience of goodness in life and even healing and filling in for the absence thereof. That's that. <laughs>